The agenda this week assessed the significance of flooding across the Great Lakes and looked into challenges facing French language education in the province. It hasn't sunk in how important the Great Lakes are to, to our economy. It really hasn't, because if, if, if the, the government has been stepping away and getting away with, and not just the recent government, I'm talking about governments all the way back to the, to the 80s and 90s, have been stepping away and getting away with it, but uh, as the damage is accumulating and the problems accumulate. So uh, we have to wake up and turn our attention to the Great Lakes. It's, a, it's one of the hugest, huge uh, environmental, ecological, and economic uh, values that we have in, in this part of North America. Is there a role for, I don't know what, innovation, new technology to help oh, us yes. out of this? Oh, yeah. For yeah. example? Well, for example, just well, something as simple as beaches. Uh, you know, one of the one things we looked at, we looked at, well, and the problem with so many beaches being closed, 15% of the beaches uh, are unusable in, on, uh, in the Upper Great Lakes. Uh, and, and why is that? Well, part of the reason is just some, the, the technology associated with uh, the water testing. It takes too long. There are better techniques, and, and they could be implemented and give us much faster responses. And then uh, and in terms of, uh, oh, and another example of technology, and in terms of the, uh, um, the, the nutrient problem, we, we have uh, the United States has pioneered wonderful technologies of, of tracking and identifying with all the data that's available to us now with uh, satellites and, <clears throat> and agricultural databases, we can actually pinpoint uh, where the problems, where the phosphorus is coming up from, and, and, and we can much better target the kind of responses. So there are technologies that are readily available and implemented, we just have to turn our attention to it. As, as Terry says, let's set some objectives and assign some money. I, I know when s you were here, I think, for the program in which we discussed this, this was several months ago, uh, there was considerable fear that in Trump's America, this was going to be a much lower priority. Mm. And, uh, for mm. example, the EPA was being defunded and mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. However, I am hearing in this discussion that the Americans are doing some things better than us. Is that right, Nicola? Well, it's, it's fascinating. I actually, it was an absolute coincidence, but I was in Washington the day uh, that uh, the Trump administration announced its cuts, its proposed cuts to GLRI. GLRI? GLRI, Great, Great Lakes, Lakes Restoration Re Initiative. That's a $300 million fund. It's been going on for nine years, started under um, uh, George W. Bush, implemented by Barack Obama, has strong bipartisan support. And I watched at this uh, legislative breakfast, one by one, a Democrat and a Republican uh, senator or representative from the House coming up and lambasting the Trump administration's proposal. Mm -hmm. I was, I was just amazed um, that somehow the Great Lakes region on the U.S. side came together uh, at, in a bipartisan way to say uh, we want the kind of money that the Everglades is getting. The Everglades were getting a lot of money, and they lobbied for years. They had mayors, they had tribes, they had states all coming together. Did it work? And it worked. So they have had over $2 billion in spending, federal spending, on Great Lakes projects, restoration projects, waterfront projects, um, uh, wetlands projects, uh, areas of concern cleaned up. Uh, we haven't seen that kind of money. If you're the Minister of Education, as you once were, and you're trying to find the sweet spot between making sure that the French language system is truly French uh, versus the fact that a lot of Anglophones who are capable of speaking French want to go there, but that may affect the actual Frenchness of the school system, how do you find that sweet spot that's going to satisfy everybody? Well, I think I think that's a big challenge, actually, and, and I don't know what the magical solution is, is because you have one of those uh, wonderful things that happens in public policy where you've got this person's rights are clashing with that person's rights. And I think when the system was originally set up, I think there was a sense that um, having the, the panels decide who should be allowed into the school, because you didn't want to sort of say to the school boards, no, you know, you can't, you have no authority in terms of who walks into your school. I think at the time, seem to be the right way to do this. Um, the challenge that this, this, this system, the whole governance structure the system has had, I think, since day one, is that because, uh, uh, you know, again, of the geographic distances that have been mentioned, uh, the critical mass that, that just hasn't been there, trying to maintain and build quality in the two French systems has been a challenge since day one. And I'm hoping, like, one of the solutions might be uh, to try and, and do more to get more um, French language 
instruction, more teachers who are capable of either who are francophones who can go into teaching or anglophones who can learn how to be very, very good French instruction. And, and I get very much that there's a, there's a big difference between being able to just speak a language and understand and culturally, you know, uh, have that language. Um, there's a big difference. Yeah. I mean, um, the problem that, that I've heard people discuss yeah. is that is that with 45% of the kids in the French language school system being Anglophone, yeah. if you go outside at recess, those kids are speaking English. Yeah. And that doesn't keep the yeah. kind of the French character of the school system. But I think one of the things, and I don't know if this would ever happen, but I think one of the problems is that we're, everyone is so concerned about, and I understand that, protecting rights, that you kind of need to say, okay, can we just have a conversation amongst all the players? Let's set the constitutional stuff outside the door for a minute. And are there some practical solutions that might help? I don't know, but um, one of the problems in this area is you keep tripping over, if I can put it that way, um, constitutional rights that, that the different groups have. The other challenge, of course, these days, um, which didn't exist as much in the 90s, but certainly is a major challenge today, is just the multicultural diversity of Ontario society. Because there are many parents who are saying, excuse me, I mean, this is cool, French, English, whatever, um, but they want a school system uh, that is more respectful of their particular language or their particular multicultural background. So that starts Which is to... not constitutionally protected, no, that's, however. Yes, that's quite right. But um, uh, I must say... But they have greater numbers. Political pressure. Right, we get that. Absolutely. That's just some of what we covered this week on the agenda. For more, including the full conversations, you can visit our website. That's tvo.org our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, that's twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.